So welcome everybody. I'm happy to see people here. Uh, um, welcome to Professor Shavit, who comes from uh, Delhi College and uh, Technion in uh, Technion in Israel. And um, well, um, we both uh, we all very happy to to have her here. Uh, we got to know her work, uh, Robert and I, when we were doing a reading group on the. Uh, philosophy of biodiversity and we, we got uh, really interested in, in how she discussed the role of values in uh, uh, biodiversity surveys and uh, and this this, uh, this this concept of locality that didn't seem to be as simple as as it seemed um, so voila uh, thank you and so I will talk a little bit about uh, locality but um, I found a similar uh, interesting problem with a difference. So I, I will talk about uh, the meanings and implications of everyday measurements. When you want to measure difference, and when you want to measure difference in a, in a place, in a locality. Um, so let's see. Let's see what happens. So first of all, the bottom line, what do I want to try and convince you of? That um, by definition, right, biodiversity models, they track, diverse, they track differences. They track biological differences. But they track differences across and within localities. Given that they need to measure a difference and they need to, they need to measure a difference in a place. And I will argue that different and at some interesting points, conflicting measures of difference and conflicting measures of locality exist. And these gaps and at times these conflicts um, reveal value-laden gaps. That's one point. Second, the ignoring these gaps, <clears throat> these gaps within the meaning of difference um, and the meaning of a uh, locality. Ignoring these gaps has or implies non-trivial costs. And these costs are epistemic, but they're also moral. And they often afflict underrepresented communities. And with these underrepresented communities come a uh, cost for the local flagship species that these underrepresented communities care about. Uh, so ignoring these gaps is not just a matter of, it's not semantic, definitely not in the, what Hilary Putnam calls trivially semantic. These difference, these semantical differences come with a cost. So, Instead of these prices, what I suggest is uh, what I try to sketch. It with with it's not it's not just me. It's with my colleagues. Uh, what we what I suggest with their help is to track difference not only by diversity, but to track heterogeneity alongside diversity. Not to suffice with measuring difference only by diversity or biodiversity and not to track locality only by lat long coordinates but to track microhabitats and niche constructed microhabitats alongside lat long coordinates so enrich what i suggested to enrich the ways you measure difference the ways you measure your locality and lastly um, when you measure things, noticing uh, these aspects of locality and difference, do it in a proactive way that also notices hierarchical structures. So the common, <coughs> the common theme for all my suggestions is um, when you care about difference, when you care about locality, track interaction. A, a locality is not just out there, uh, and difference is not just things positioned one next to the other. Uh, track and try to measure 
interactions. So these are the bottom line. And the structure will be very brief uh, of what is a model and how do biodiversity models track difference. And then I will offer two different measures of difference. There's, there's a long tradition about what is a difference. I'm not going to talk about it, only about measures and the measure of diversity and the measure of heterogeneity. And in the Q&A, we can go also into mathematical formalizations. Here, I will offer uh, first a very informal account of the difference between diversity and heterogeneity because people use it as synonymous, right? It's, it's in everyday speech, it's the same. It's synonymous. And so I'll offer an informal account of the difference and then uh, a more formal, philosophical uh, account of the difference because I, I understood that mostly philosophers are here, but I also have the, the formalization for uh, professional ecologists if they want. Okay. And so I will talk about these two different measures and uh, what is the epistemic price of ignoring heterogeneity? What is the price of measuring biodiversity only via diversity? What does it cost us epistemically? And what do we benefit by noticing heterogeneity? Okay? Then, uh, I will face a, a criticism, a very valid one, that says, uh, well, that's all very nice, but does this diversity, heterogeneity, uh, distinction practically matter? It's very nice for your philosophy talk, but does it matter for someone who cares about biodiversity conservation in the real world? And I will argue, or cares about social diversity within an academic institution. Okay, so are your do your distinctions practically matter? And I will argue that yes, they matter. This gap sometimes uh, is, produces a conflict between diversity and heterogeneity. Not just different, but it's a conflict. Um, and, okay. so this conflict is underlied by uh, value-laden gaps, the gap between and wanting to say something general about the world, wanting your data to represent uh, some other data in some other localities, and uh, the value of being accurate at a certain locality about a certain chain of events. And, and the same type of gap between uh, the, the value of being real or accurate and the value of being generalizable, the same type of gap underlies a measure of locality, an incommensurability in the measure of locality. It's even worse than a conflict. When it comes to locality, the gap, it, they, the measures, they don't only conflict, they're incommensurable. Because we don't know from where to start to, to, to decide something, okay? So it's a, it's a worse problem. Um, and I will present a case, a case study. Uh, it's called Town Square Academia. It's a project, it's a proactive project that I'm involved in since 2011. And it illustrates the moral and epistemic price of one's measurement choice. And this measurement choice is done in a peripheral area in northern Israel, where I live and where my Tel Chai College is located. And this peripheral area is also a biodiversity hotspot. And so I'll present the problem and also how noticing heterogeneity can, can maybe help resist some of the problems. And uh, you need, we need a conclusion, there, there will be one. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. What's the problem? Nothing's happening. So a very short note about models. There's a huge li literature about this. I'm just taking out of the shelf a uh, uh, definition that I really like by Michael Weisberg. And a model is an incomplete representation. It's specified by descriptions. What I mean by description 
is uh, word, it can be words or pictures or mathematical formulations uh, followed by some legend. So the, the representation is specified by a description and an interpretation. Now interpretation, what do I mean? I mean a prediction. So given the description, which can also be like a causal chain, uh, a model sometimes deduces, not always, an interpretation and a prediction about the, the phenomenon or the target in the world. Now, what do I mean by a, a causal explanation in a model, which is part of the model description? Here I use uh, Scriven's uh, account of causal explanation, and it amounts to identifying a factor that makes a difference for an idealized model. What does it mean that it makes a difference? That if we, t we move, we take outside of the model uh, that uh, difference maker, the model, it prevents the model from entailing the occurrence of the phenomenon that we're trying to track. So this means a causal explanation in the model. Okay, uh, so how do biodiversity models track differences? And again, I'm not talking about difference per se. It holds, a, you know, since Leibniz's principle of indiscriminate. So difference has a long history of research, and most of it I will not touch at all. I will only talk about how differences are measured within models, either biodiversity models or social models. And in everyday language, measuring difference uh, is, means measuring uh, the diversity of the entity or its heterogeneity. And in everyday language, heterogeneity and diversity are used synonymously. Colleges typically use the term diversity. Um, uh, but um, outside of the paper, you will uh, often find the use of heterogeneity. Math so I, don't, I won't go into it, but in, t in the paper, we talk about the different research cultures, uh, statisticians, ecologists, social scientists, each one has its own culture of using these terms. In everyday language, they're used as if they're synonymous. And uh, what do biodiversity models typically do? They track species diversity in a locality, typically a long-term track, and uh, you want to track differences in uh, either species richness or species diversity, species composition. You want to track some uh, long-term uh, difference in species in correlation with some long-term difference in, I don't know, average uh, temperature, rainfall, land use, and, and you want to track that uh, on a long-term basis. So after we cleared, oh, okay. so after all that introduction, I want to say that diversity and heterogeneity are far from synonymous far from synonymous. And just to give you an informal account, it's like the difference between a zoo, the difference between diversity and heterogeneity is the difference between, in a nutshell, between a zoo and an ecosystem. Or the difference between a queue and, a, and like a social uh, task force or workforce. So, <clears throat> You can have the same number of species, even the same, with the same abundance, in the same area, in a zoo or in an ecosystem. But the survival of these species and the survival of the zoo as a whole does not depend on the interaction between these species at all. Whereas it's crucial, the interaction between these species, the structure of their interaction, who eats who. And the intensity of these interactions are crucial for the survival of these giraffes in the ecosystem and the survival of the ecosystem savanna as a whole. Okay? To give you a different example, uh, the, the pictures on the wall here, they are di they, they're diverse in the sense that there's these different pictures, one next to the other, but the wall does not depend on them. It's just diversity tracks differences. 
But heterogeneity pre-assumes a collective that depends on the specific kind of differences and how they interact with each other. So the same people could be standing in the queue and these exact same people, once they enter the theater, can decide, I don't know, they could be standing here uh, waiting to hear uh, talk about climate change. And then they can enter the, the theater and decide to establish a climate change, I don't know, a, a party. Now in Israel they're talking about establishing a new party. We don't have enough. Uh, about climate change, okay? So here, even if the people interact, it doesn't matter to the individual success or the, the, the success of moving along the queue. But here, their interactions are crucial for the success of their party, and the structure of interaction is crucial. And that's the difference between diversity and heterogeneity, okay? Um, to say it a bit more formally, uh, so the property of heterogeneity describes an object. Both diversity and heterogeneity are properties of some kind of group. Okay, it depends if the group is a Q or. or. And uh, in heterogeneity, this object, this entity, upholds three criteria. First, there's a difference between the entities that comprise this uh, object, and there's interaction between these different entities within a collective, okay? So there's an assumption, a pre-assumption of a collective that depends on the type of interaction, and the third one is integration. So, so the whole somehow depends on uh, this in type of, the differences matter to the whole, okay? Uh, whereas, so, so if I take the, you know, like the pictures on the wall, the, the wall doesn't, but for my watch, it's crucial. The different sizes of the wheels and how they interact with each other. If, if there's something in the interaction changes, my, walk, my, my watch won't function, okay? So the parts of the watch are heterogeneous. Okay? And the pictures on the wall are diverse. Uh, so, only the first criteria of difference between entities matters for diversity. So, diverse groups can be heterogeneous, but heterogene heterogeneous groups must be diverse. So heterogeneity is a type, special type of diversity. Okay? Um, and, because they're different, they require different formulations, and if you want, we can talk about that more during the Q&A. Um, that's a formal distinction. So you might think it's a bit weird that I said before that diversity and heterogeneity conflict. How can they conflict in, if one is a special case of the other? How, how could that be? I mean, I have to decide, right? Either they conflict or the one is a special case of the other. And so what I'm arguing is that uh, conceptually there's a gap, even a deep gap between them, and the conflict is not a conceptual conflict. So it doesn't, they don't have to conflict, but I'll try to convince you that uh, in, in certain cases that we often really care about, that's when they conflict. So the conflict, even though they're not necessary, it's an empirical question whether there's a conflict or not. The conflict matters, uh, and it matters for uh, the biodiversity and uh, the communities around biodiversity hotspots that we care about. Okay, so uh, ignoring heterogeneity, sufficing with just measuring diversity can come at an epistemic price. So, what is the price? That if you think that the survival of particular species depends on the interactions of other species in the ecosystem, especially um, endangered or rare species, 
okay? Then, um, measuring differences while neglecting interactions and neglecting the view of the ecosystem as a collective might mean that in your model, you neglected um, a, a relevant causal factor, okay? So uh, you neglected the ecological interaction within the biological community, the same biological community that you're tracking. You, you, you don't, it's not that you say there are no interaction, it's just that you say it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter enough for my model, for the predictions that my model will deduce. So that's one part, and, and, but the other, especially in peripheral areas, and for uh, endangered and uh, endemic species, the, you also ignore the cultural interaction within the human community that often lives next to the biological community that you're tracking. And often, that human community affects, might affect the chances of survival of the species or the ecosystem that you care about. Okay? So you, by, by measuring biodiversity alone and by measuring social diversity alone, you're actually saying interaction don't matter. And what I'm tracking, the entity that I'm tracking is not a collective, it's just, it's, it's a collection of things, one next to the other. Okay? And so for some species, for some communities, it's fine. Sufficing with diversity alone indeed could lead could lead to, to wonderful uh, predictions, okay? But for some species and for some communities, particularly underrepresented communities and endemic flat species, uh, in that case, sufficing with diversity alone could lead to an inaccurate model, both in the level of the description, the causal, the causal explanation, and at the level of the, the prediction the model limitation, okay? Um, so, <clears throat> that's, that's, uh, sorry, that's in the sense of what could it cost you if you ignore heterogeneity? You might have, and in the paper we, we show, different predictions, the model will produce different predictions under a different formalization of tracking difference, okay? So you might worry that your model will be inaccurate. But now I want to, in the next slide, I want to uh, argue that there's also benefits if you want to track uh, heterogeneity. Okay? Not just this also. And here, uh, when you track heterogeneity, you must notice interactions. It's, it's, uh, th there's no way ignoring interactions and you're tracking not only the connectedness within your network, it comes from a network theory, so you're not only uh, recording how many uh, connections exist, but also their uh, relative strength, okay? So you must track interactions and different types of interaction and often lead to different types of groups. So you have to care about the type of group that you're standing, that you're observing, okay? This is something that you can completely and safely ignore if you're measuring diversity. You, you just don't care about the group, whether it exists or not. Doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And here I want to show you a sketch metal model. Um, so if you are, and, and I want to really thank um, uh, Jim Griesemer, who was, uh, oh, sorry, oh, mm -hmm. okay. uh, who was my postdoc <coughs> advisor, uh, and it's such a joy after many years to be working with him again. So mm -hmm. the term, the three C model, is, is is his term. So if you track diversity, what it helps you to do. Uh, is noticed interactions and group. And this model, the 3C model, it tracks three different kinds of interaction processes, 
three different kinds of processes that often lead to the buildup of different types of groups, different objects. Okay? Um, it's a gradual process and that's why it's called the three C's. It's actually the six C's. Okay? So, um, this, if you notice the process, you would treat your ecosystem or your community or your society, whatever, or your assemblage of species, you would, if you track different processes lead to different, uh, might lead to different types of objects, and if you care about conservation, they might lead you to advancing a different type of activity, different type of conservation activity. Now, this is a highly idealized model. It's not like with the heterogeneity diversity models. It's not a mathematical one. It's a conceptual sketch. And we're now working on it. its mathematical formalization, but it's far from ready. And, and, and so, okay. Um, it's idealized also in the sense that it doesn't always have to go this way, right? It's not a one-way track, and not in evolutionary terms, not in ecological terms. But um, what I'm suggesting here is not that um, it always happens this way, but I'm suggesting um, a general schema that might explain some cultural evolutionary emergence and some ecological uh, evolutionary emergence and some uh, benefits to particular <coughs> types of policy. It's just a, a general schema that might help us think about some of the processes we see. But it, it doesn't have to go this way, it can go we already found cases that it goes that way. But this, this direction, okay. So what we're saying that when there's low or minimal, uh, relatively minimal interaction processes within the different, the different units in the collection, in the collection <coughs> um, these minimal interaction processes, what they do is that they typically locate or position objects or events in order. So when there's very low uh, individual interaction, what you get is different uh, entities that are coordinated. We, we don't want to crash onto each other. Okay, so we do this minimal coordination. I'll drive the car on the right hand and you'll drive the car on the right hand and we won't crash. Or, uh, oh, sorry. Or in the um, evolutionary terms or in the ecological terms, there will be minimal coordination of, I don't know, uh, the camel uh, going on the same footsteps of the camel before him. Okay? Uh, when the path is steep. So when you have these minimal uh, coordination type of organization, the the type of interaction, what they're expected uh, to produce, is a collection. A collection of entities that are co-located one next to the other, according to this order. Um, and it can be, and when this happens, you can model it well enough with diversity. Okay, it's just these different entities located one next to the other. And in the ecological sphere, such measure may fit common species that uh, uh, what you mostly need to know is where they are located. Um, but typically, uh, they don't fit rare or endemic ones whose survival typically depends on a particular set of interactions among a particular set of species. So, um, only, okay, I don't want to repeat myself. Uh, in the local 
so, so in the local sphere, not the ecological sphere, uh, assuming that uh, the humans only coordinate and they're just part of a collection, there's just this collection of people. There is no collective here, or if it does, it doesn't matter. So if the local human society <coughs> is a relevant factor for conserving this species, okay, a collection of human individual is not likely to produce any joint labor. But only each one of us need to follow some kind of rule. I don't know, don't pick the flowers. Take your rubbish with you. Okay? And, and if it's correct that you need a whole village, not just to raise a child, but you need a whole village to preserve some flagship uh, species, then a conservation activity of this kind might not be very efficient for the type of species we care about. Again, for some species, this is great. This is all you need. Okay? Now, when intensity of interaction increases, what you get um, what you get, the, 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 what emerges, okay, is a more uh, complex object. It's a joint meeting point of different uh, organized organisms. And such a connectus, uh, such a connectus is complex, but it doesn't have to be integrated. There is no necessary integration, there is no necessary common goal. There could be, but it's, it's not built in in uh, the community. So, uh, group, the group here requires some reciprocal cooperation. Okay? So different entities cooperate. Okay? It's different than co-labor. And the type of uh, interaction uh, we are expecting is uh, reciprocal. So, without... Okay, so what we get here is that within this nexus, um, each organism, each individual node, sorry, doesn't, the node doesn't have to be an organism. The node here can be, the individual node here can be a species, it can be uh, a population. But each individual <coughs> node in the system, the node can be, I don't know, a family, or a village, or an individual. Each node in the system <coughs> cooperates to maximize its own benefits. Okay? It's this win-win system. And a happy benefit might be, okay, a mutual benefit. Mutual benefit can emerge, but it's, it's just an epiphenomenon. You see, it doesn't have to emerge. What does have to emerge is some kind of individual uh, win, okay? So, um, mutual benefit is not a prayer request, and um, if we, in many conservation efforts, the aim is for win-win, okay? The social interaction sought after is that everyone will win. What actually happens is often um, a degradation or uh, a special effort on the part of the uh, weaker party. Win-win situation, okay, it does not assume we are part of the same community. No, we, it, it's not necessary. And what often uh, happens is that we do not aim for any change of structure. Within the structure that we have, each one of us tries to benefit, to maximize one's individual uh, gains, 
okay? So, as time goes by, and every time we meet again, and we uh, struck this deal, what, may off, what, what we've seen in the case study that we followed is that the weaker party finds it more and more difficult each time to enter this game, okay? Because no, uh, we do not belong together to any kind of a common community. So if, an, if this happens for a long enough time and it's intense enough, sometimes, not necessarily, a transition occurs. And then what we get is not just cooperation, it's collaboration. And there's a huge gap between cooperation and collaboration because collaboration assumes a common community. And what entities do is that they participate, we become a part of this community, okay? And here, here, uh, the joint labor is taking place as a necessary aspect of taking part within a larger whole. So noticing and tracking these different types of interactions um, <coughs> as required by the heterogeneity index not only differs from the diversity index, but in some context, okay? Uh, I will try to show you it, uh, later on that these types of measures, <coughs> they conflict. What you need to see here is that reciprocity does not change anything dramatic in the social structure or in the interaction structure, but collaboration does. Something has changed in the structure, the tr after the transition, we are part of something uh, different than when we were before. And not only do we work for our own individual gains, but we work for some common um, group. Okay, so someone might say, and it makes perfect sense, to say, look, this is all very nice, but scientists, and especially conservationists, we work in the real world, Nothing is perfect. It's really difficult to measure all what you want here, okay? So instead of dwelling on semantic detail and instead of adding all these complex requirements of measurement, what we really should do now, even if we all agree that we want to reach this collaboration stage, what we really should do now is measure diversity carefully notice diversity urgently and try to have a good uh, measure of diversity in ecological and in the social world. And it's, it's a plausible expectation that if we measure diversity well enough and if our policies reward diversity well enough, eventually and gradually diversity will bring us to heterogeneity. Okay, so from a collection of entities, we will reach a community of collaboration. And uh, what I argue is that this is misleading. And it's misleading both epistemically and morally. So here's an example of how, and the reason it, it okay, here's an example of how diversity cannot be a stepping stone towards and uh, cannot always be a stepping stone towards heterogeneity because they conflict sometimes. So, um, what you have sometimes is that even if, okay, even if diversity significantly increases, so let's say uh, we had an area with old growth forest and uh, we start cutting it and overall uh, there's a significant increase of diversity in that locality, okay? Or uh, we had a university with very few minorities and we let a lot of new, uh, I don't know, a lot of women will suddenly be here, okay? Or other types of groups. So even if diversity increases, okay, as long as diversity increases but the structure of inf interaction is ignored. And when it's ignored, actually what we do here is that we, it, it, it's, 
the, the structure remains intact, okay? Because we don't measure it, we don't do any policy changes uh, according to it. So let's say that, uh, then that if we began with an unequal type of interaction or an unequal social structure, let's say unequal land ownership or an unequal social demographic level, Okay? But we completely ignore it. So um, we a lot of more women enter the university, okay? Or uh, we see that they, they sit <coughs> over here. They sit around the ta they sit around the table. Or uh, we, in, indeed, we see overall increase of diversity in a locality. As long as we don't address the interaction structure and it remains intact, okay? And it remains intact for a long, long, long time. What happens is that distrust often emerges among the underrepresented groups. So if women see more and more women here, but they notice that they don't talk, and they're not deans, and they're not managing anything here, they're just sitting, there's more women at the table, but they don't call the shots, or, okay, we see that uh, there's more diversity, but nothing in land ownership changes. And for that particular community, let's say the Bedouin community where I live, land ownership is, is a crucial thing. 95% of the land in Israel is state land. Okay? But the, 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 it's, a, it's a Jewish state. And if you are a Bedouin Muslim, sometimes you feel, this is not my state. I'm not talking about the occupied territories. I'm talking about within Israel, 20% of Israeli citizens, um, I mean, maybe 17 are Muslim, another 3% are Christian, I'm not exactly sure, but 20% are not Jewish. Okay? So um, nothing has changed, and people invite you to participate in conservation, but nothing has changed in land ownership. And people tell you how important it is uh, not, to, uh, not to hunt uh, gazelles, okay? And to be part of the discussion of conservation, but nothing changed in land ownership. What often happens is that you talk amongst yourself. You feel a higher and higher degree of distrust. So the rangers who come to talk with you in the class about conservation, they're Jews, and they belong to the state, most of them, okay? Um, and the more there's diversity, and there's more and more uh, women around here, so you might find, or there's more and more Bedouins that uh, their view is taken into account, okay? If it go oh, so if it goes on for enough time, they will continue to talk and express their views, but do it amongst themselves. So you will find, I don't know, in the social realm, these safe zones in, co in U.S. colleges. And you will find here um, that the threat to these rare flagship species increases, increases, because now people from that community say, wait, I want to I wanna express my own my own culture, my own community. We hunt. This is part of our community. This is part of our culture. You tell us how important it is, okay? So I'll continue to do this. And there's a greater and greater alienation. So what you get is the reduce of interaction between the local group and other groups. And in short, what you get is a conflict. Okay, so uh, you, the heterogeneity is reduced because people don't interact with each other. And you get a conflict. And this may explain conservation failure, especially among marginalized groups. And it's especially sad because marginalized groups often live next to biodiversity hotspots. But they consider conservation the white man issue. <coughs> the Jews' problem, 
okay, and, and where I come from, the Zionist part. So, this uh, diversity heterogeneity conflict may also explain why focusing on and sufficing with diversity, okay, only with diversity measures, both in, the society, in our society, how we measure social diversity, and in ecology, how we measure biodiversity, is not expected to be a stepping stone towards increasing heterogeneity. If we want to preserve these specific rare species, th that's not the way how, it, it's, it's not going to be easier. A policy that's, um, that is relevant only to diversity. And in a social realm, there's, at least in the US and also in Israel, there's a lot of uh, measures of social diversity and, and the university <coughs> gets money if it enters more groups and minorities. But once these minorities are in, how much is invested in their interaction with others? Nothing. And so they leave. Okay? And they feel often a bigger failure than before and more alienated with the general culture than before. Okay? So increasing diversity as much as possible is sometimes in conflict with increasing heterogeneity. Okay, so a similar problem, okay, what underlies this is a conflict or, or, or a gap between if you want accuracy, you're asking yourself, did my model interpretation fit the data? You're asking yourself, did my model prediction, did my survey, my experiment, my, my explanation, did it detect a causal process or did I just detect, I stumbled on some random effect? So one aim <coughs> in your model is realism. The other aim is uh, generality. You want to extrapolate. You want your work in that locality. So yes, I care about the specific uh, Bedouin community and that specific gazelle. But I also want my model to be general. And it has, so all my results that I measured in a given context or a given locality, whether or not my results are founded upon causes or random sets of events, are these results representative of other localities? That's a different question, okay? And we want both, but they differ. That's the issue here. And that differ is relevant to another problem in uh, biodiversity models and measurements. And that's the measurement of a locality. So I'm reminding you that what we do is long-term sampling. It's crucial for tracking biodiversity loss, okay? So we want to go back and back to the same locality and we want to measure that locality to make sure that we came back to it. But different practical meanings of space, what is that space? Uh, assume different values that suggest different location measures. So is the space exogenous, abstract from the entity that's located in that space? Or, like with heterogeneity, is that space interacting? Is the entity in that space interacting with that space? Does, does it construct its niche? Okay, or is it just there? So if you have different meanings of space, you, and you have different values for what is the best practice, okay, or the best resampling method, um, you have to choose. If one, and you cannot execute both methods on the same spatial scale at the same time. So what you get is an inevitable problem of locality. Uh, and I'll give you a, an example, okay? So, you have uh, this exogenous con uh, concept of space. I came here today, right? So, I came here using an exogenous concept of space. That is, I had a, um, actually, let's assume I came here this way. I could have had a point, a lat long coordinate, which is right here, and I would follow that lat long coordinate and arrive here, okay? And that concept of space doesn't care what's here. It's just a point, okay? <coughs> and, and what it gives me is a value of generality. It's the same all over, okay? 
But I could arrive here by following instructions of telling me, look, you go to this universe, this new Levoin that was established in 1970s and look for that building, and go up to the second store. So here, here it's the specific people who are here. <coughs> Niche constructed this locale. And now it's not very general. It depends on who's here and what he did. Okay, but it is, it is a representative of realism in the sense that I talked before, okay? It describes what is exactly here, okay? So here, um, uh, the best way is randomized positions, and here the best way is targeted position of my, my measurement device, okay? So it's very, very different. It's a conflict, but it gets worse why it gets worse. It's not just a conflict. It's incommensurable. Because the routine working protocol requires you to do things completely the other way around. So let's say you care mostly about generality and you want your model to be general. So what you do, you pick at home your randomized GP, uh, GPS points, okay? And and then you go out to the field with your, uh, and you find them. You find these maps. You find these points. I don't know, every 10 meters. You find these points. You follow the abstract space. You put, you put the, uh, I don't know, your cups for your ants, right? You put them there, and only then you record which microhabitat you found. But, if you, assume, if you care about uh, which animal particularly is there, uh, and you care about the biology of the ground squirrel you're following, it doesn't work that way. You, it's completely the opposite. First you go out to the field, and you track microhabitats. You ask yourself, okay, where will the ground squirrel, where can I find it? Okay, let's take something bushy-tailed wood, at least something rarer, okay? And now you track microhabitats. Once you found the relevant niche-constructed microhabitat that a bushy-tailed wood rat would choose, then you record the GPS points. You can't do it both. You can't, okay? So often, and, and often people think, philosophers, so, so this is the problem, and there's no compromise here. There is no middle ground, okay? And often people think that incommensurability is a problem of no fact of the matter. How much more time do I have? So people think it's a question of... Run about 10 minutes. Ah, well, okay, so I'll run. <laughs> if you want, I, I can talk about this more because uh, people often conflate incommensurability with no fact of the matter. Oh, no, 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 there is fact of the matter. Either the device is here or it's here. It's an empirical incommensurability. No fact of the matter is something completely different. This happens at the next scale. This is indeterminacy of reference or indeterminacy of translation. Okay? Here, you can't translate. So when I talk to these people, both in, in, in Berkeley and in Harvard and in Israel, each one of them, they didn't say the other guy was wrong or impractical. They said, I couldn't understand him. You know, he's, he's a reasonable guy. He's actually a good biologist. These guys wrote the grant together. But in the field, it doesn't work together. It cannot, okay? So there is fact of the matter, and there is no way to decide. And if you want, we can talk about other concepts like indeterminacy later on. Okay, so here I want to show you <coughs> a case study um, that actually uh, puts, brings this to light. Okay? And it's a project called Town Square Academia. Uh, 2011, there was a, here you had, there was the Arab Spring, if you heard about it. And here, I think you had something different. 
and I'm not I'm not exactly sure what. But in the U.S., they had Occupy Wall Street, and in Israel, we had it was called a town a tent tent movement. Okay, and and so the idea was to look critically at academia and at existing uh, power structures and to try and change them. So I only followed my students and tried to do something. Um, and it combines um, what it does, this project, Town Square Academia, it's voluntary researchers, local experts, volunteer with academic experts, and together they try to build local knowledge that will affect conservation policy and will affect social policy. Okay? So the problem is that minority groups, okay, uh, living like these Bedouin groups, living in a biodiversity <coughs> hotspot, okay, they're not considered experts. And their heritage and their knowledge about the plants is completely irrelevant to the models and to the conservation policy. Okay? So they suffer not just epistemic injustice. Do you know what epistemic injustice is? Okay. So they suffer not just epistemic injustice, but also environmental injustice. Okay? The land where uh, this stream, where their stream exists, is not even their own. Okay? In Israel, it's easy. I see the injustice right in front of my eyes. Okay? It's, it's, um, okay. So what we <coughs> oh, okay. so what we do typically the, the sampling and um, the typical sampling uh, maps they do not record <coughs> data on location <coughs> history. So if there's no record on location history, they they have no claim of saying, look, this is the name of our stream, this is our stream, and this is the type of things we do with these types of plants. The name of the stream is not their own on all the official maps, okay? Um, and the, okay. And, and all their knowledge about, well, I don't have time. Okay. So, uh, what also biodiversity models do not do, okay, is th they don't record how they interact with their land. They don't record the, the, the different structure and the different power structures within Israel, okay? So policy recommendations, when, when, when the state says, I'm fair, I'm equal, I'm treating everyone the same way. <coughs> no, they treat everyone the same way, but they disregard the inequality that exists. So what people here feel is not being treated the same way. And what this project does, uh, okay, I don't have that, but what this project does is bring to light both, and, and on a GIS map, you put, you establish a new trail, putting in the original names with the original history, combining academics with local experts, and bringing this to the government. And now it's not just this local knowledge of this group of Bedouins. It's, it's a collective that comes together to the state and it has way more power. And this trail, for example, was got an official, an official uh, authority. And now the state is investing money in uh, its, um, how do you say, I forgot the word. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, I don't, okay. So what you see, I don't have time. Ah. But what you can see here is old maps from, uh, from the, and how on the old maps you think you use local knowledge for correcting historical maps. Within this uh, conservation world, you put layers upon layers in your GIS maps, but you, the first map is wrong. You can see different, you don't have time, but there's different names for uh, the, the streams. And there's different, the, the British who did this, they used standardized legends. So, uh, so, so for, for example, here, what you're supposed to see is vineyards, because they used the same thing for all across the Middle East, vineyards. So you have here 
deep, deep problems when you just begin with the model. And what you do, you use local knowledge to correct the historical maps, and you use heterogeneity differences, okay, for reclaiming one's history and one's policy. And then you put a sign with your history and your uh, suggested policy. And uh, I don't have time, so all I want to say, there's much more to say about all of this. But notice how it's very, very small details of how you measure something that make a huge difference later on, okay? So I want to say this, diversity is not similar to heterogeneity, okay? <coughs> no one increasing the former eventually increase the latter. No, it matters. These gaps matter. Second, a locality, Laplan coordinates, is not clearly translatable to its microhabitat. And, and I, don't, I didn't have time to actually fully show this to you. But the problem gets worse, the better science you do. So the more accurate you are, the bigger the problem becomes. OK? Um, and the more, uh, uh, already I said that. The more accurate the measurement, the deeper the incommensurability. Uh, so because these measures, we assume different practical meanings, values, and at times different causes in the model, okay? And at times different policy costs for minority. Because all this, oh, sorry. So because these measures do all this, it's really important to track interactions and to build measurements that track interactions. And I want to finish by saying something about failures. Because a project like Town Square Academia and working hard on these type of measurements, sometimes it does, it's, it's really difficult. And, and often it fails, okay? And it took us, it often fails. So why invest so much time and effort in a project or in a type of measurement that will often fail, okay? And here's my argument, that a project like this, like Town Square Academia, okay, that promotes a heterogeneous measure of difference and an interactionist concept of space. And thus, by doing so, it increases the dialogue between dissenting social groups, okay, and it reduces epistemic injustice, afflicting underrepresented groups, okay? So given the basic importance of problems in measurement and the basic problem of injustice and conservation failure among minorities. Given all that, even if a program like Town Square Academia only sometimes succeeds, perhaps even rarely succeeds, it is an important success whenever it happens. I'm not saying do it always. I'm not saying, uh, but I'm saying where it matters to you Okay, it's, it should always be attempted before it's ruled out. So try first to model and to measure interactions. And if it doesn't work, leave it alone. But don't begin by skipping it because it's hard. Okay, that's it. See, there's a lot of people helping here in this part. It's, it's a, there's a lot of people volunteering so much time and effort <coughs> to, to this uh, project. It's, it's, um, it's, very, it's highly rewarding. Thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, really nice. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I'm not going to abuse my, my um, uh, position as chair. So if anyone has some questions before, Yes, Peter? Yeah, thanks a lot for the great talk. Uh, so, I'm, um, I, I, I follow, I think I understand more or less the, the hydrogenity uh, distinction with, with, the, with the diversity, but I'm a bit surprised about the, uh, the easiness with which uh, we go from ecology and, and, and species to 
cultural things that are obviously much more value laden and so on and might conflict. Uh, so are interactions between cultures and people and so on even measurable in similar ways as interactions uh, in what, yeah, well, giraffes and, and other species and so on? Um, I mean, <coughs> is, you, you, you completely put them on a bar, it seems it like that there is like a, a, a sort of gradual distinction, if there is already a distinction, but like these value <coughs> issues, they play so much more once we talk about humans. And so I, I, so I was wondering what you... That's an excellent and tough question. Um, I'm looking at measures. And it's, it's astonishing, and I can show you on the graph, but the, the exact formula, Simpson Index for diversity, the exact formulation, independently uh, devised, is the Hirschfeld, Hirsch or something, and that's how social diversity is measured. Exactly the same. So policy about social diversity in the social sphere is measured, is the, the policy is based on measures that are exactly the same, okay? It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that the world, the biological world and the social world are the same. Not at all. I'm looking at how we measure things because I think how we measure things really matters about what we care about. And, and I totally agree with you that there's a deep gap and I think I was not, maybe I wasn't careful enough to stress it <coughs> and, and, and thank you for that. There, there is a huge, huge difference the, the, between uh, the ecological world and the social world. Given that difference, another point is that the social world today has an effect on the ecological world. And Therefore, just if I want to focus on the ecological world, I'm saying, look, you should, for preserving, uh, I don't know, species composition in, the, in a given ecosystem, you should also care about the, uh, the, the social interactions in the community that you're looking at. And when you ignore social interactions, and you come to the community and say, oh, each one of us will do his share, we are not a collective. It's it's not surprising that it doesn't work. Yeah, I, I completely agree with okay. that. But it seems the, like it's a huge difference. But I'm just saying, use look at look at the human groups, measure their interactions, and me, and measure their uh, uh, social structure. Do that also for improving uh, the chances of uh, your conservation efforts. Just a quick follow up if I can. Sure. Yeah. So, so it seems like one of these value issues might be that conservation in, cult in, in human culture might be actually a bad thing. I mean, we, that, that's, that's almost literally conservatism. Um, you know, like sometimes you want to change uh, human environments while in nature, like it's probably a good thing to keep it uh, if it works well. Um, and, and of course, this is a difficult thing because, like, if, 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 if uh, the white uh, guy comes to a community and says you have to change this or that, I mean, that's obviously like colonialism and, and, and dangerous. But uh, as as just humans, we want to make things better. I mean, we we values are there to, to change things after all. Um, so if you're using the same sort of language for conservation biology as for conservation in, 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 and, and relate that directly or, or like extrapolate that to humans, then isn't there a danger of, of falling in a sort of conservative, conservatism trap? Um, maybe I'm wrong, but, but let me try and... and, and and show you and, and argue for noticing uh, interaction as a way to resist conservatism. 
Okay? If your model requires you to notice structures, okay, um, versus a model that does not require you to notice structures, the first way, yes, I agree with you, I could, it could bring me to conservatism, but it doesn't have to. Another thing it could bring me is to notice inequalities and then to destabilize the same gaps or the same structures that I've seen, okay? So when I, when I look at society and, and I see this inequality, I don't know, in land use, in recognition of knowledge, in all that, if I, if I track it, I notice it. If I notice there's an option for change, in, in standard view, when the academia says we're open to everyone, <coughs> just come, just come. And I don't track any interaction and any difference in structure, it's uh, what eventually it does is conserve the inequality that exists. So I agree with you that I could, I could reach conservatism and colonialism, all that I have to mind that as well. You're absolutely right. I'm only saying I don't have to. And by looking at uh, interactions and the structure of interactions, it could actually be, and that's what's happening in Town Square Academia, it could actually be an activist tool to destabilize uh, the gaps that we have today. Great. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, I wanted to come back to the objection you discussed. Um, so you made a point there's a cost to not having the heterogeneity in your model. But obviously there's a cost as well to adding it. Like there's a huge opportunity cost. I imagine it's very just the data is difficult to collect, often you won't have the data and so on. So can we be confident that um, in that trade-off it's better to have the heterogeneity than to just use the simpler models? Um, and so connected to that, do we, like, do we have ways of estimating or measuring um, to what extent they're better or worse in achieving whatever we're trying to achieve here? So, um, first of all, it's, uh, yeah, it's, thanks for that. <coughs> what, what I tried to argue here, um, what I tried to argue here is that, no, it's, it's, uh, you don't always have to use it. And, and, for, and for many um, contexts, you don't need it. All I'm saying is that in, in some contexts that you really care about, if it's a locality, a specific locality, when you care about realism, when you, de when you deeply care about catching the causal chain in some context, Okay, either in an ecological context or in a social context. When uh, then noticing heterogeneity, I'm not. I'm saying check it out before ruling it out. I'm not saying always use it. And and you can see the difference. So with diversity <coughs> measures, what you have is quite simple. So you you put. Okay. Oh, sorry. So what you do is that you put all the, you, you, all the, okay, you count all the entities, okay, and what, what you do with them is that you, um, you measure, okay, you measure the unweighted number of individuals and then um, you weigh their number Okay, by the abundance of their species. So all you need to count here is the number of individuals, okay, weighted by the number of species. And the closer, the closer this gets to zero, the more diverse uh, your community. That's great. Uh, I don't have time for this. So there's there's various kinds of diversity. I don't know if you care about it as much. Uh, alpha, beta, gamma. But in any case, and it's, it's really fascinating, but that's in another paper. What I want to say is that I agree with you. It's a simple and it's, it's very efficient. And I'm not saying don't measure diversity. I'm saying for some contexts, 
okay? It really matters the degree of connect connections. So what you want, again, it's, here it's still not very, very complicated. So what you want here in, uh, in this, what we use here, when I say we, uh, it's Aaron. Uh, it's like, when I say we, it's like the fly on the elephant saying, how much dust did we do? <laughs> so, so he built the map and uh, my role was to say, uh, when did I understand? Uh, in, in this work. So, what you want here is in, in, uh, you use the systems theory as it's applied to interacting net networks, okay? Uh, and just like with the with Simpson index and the Hirschfeld uh, index, you can, we're working on this, but it can be used for various kinds of entities, not just biological entities, okay? So what you have here is the number of unweighted, what you have in the system is, you know, this, it's these nodes, okay, connected by ledges. And the ledges, they defined the relations between the nodes. So what you're checking here is uh, how, and this is unweighted, you check how many ledges are connecting how many nodes, okay, and the closer C is to zero, each node is not connected to anyone else. The closer this is to one, all nodes are connected by ledges to all nodes. So this is still not very complicated, and it can give you a map of interactions, okay? But for what we want, and we also want to say something about the structure and the strength of the interactions, and I agree with you, it gets more complicated. Here you want to say the transfer of, I don't know, energy or data or whatever, the transfer, okay, between the uh, ith and gth nodes, okay? And, um, and here both the nodes and the ledges are uh, weighted. And, and I agree that it often when it comes to this, it, it becomes really complicated. What we're trying to do now is translate it to something that I can measure in a conversation. Who's talking? So I'm, I'm starting, it's weird, but it's, I'm starting with humans because it seems like it's easier to count interactions in, in some ways, okay? <coughs> and, and Aaron is trying to check it out on plants. So in some, uh, for some context, to measure the discussion that's happening, who's talking, how much information is transformed, okay, really matters. I'm not saying use it always. I'm saying if I'm, I'm, I'm a Jew in, in a country that is defined as a democratic Jewish state. So I'm not a neutral person when I meet uh, a, a bit, a, another Israeli who is a Bedouin, okay? And when I talk and I say, oh, we were all together, and I don't measure anything that has to do with that, and I say, oh, we came up together to this idea, it's dangerous, okay? And so if I have something like this, I can at least know better what I don't know. And at least next time, when I come out of the meeting, and I didn't measure this, I know there's something that might be deeply misleading with what I think about the discussion that happened, okay? So yes, sometimes it's completely redundant, no. But sometimes, where you really care, try, try. That's all I'm saying. <coughs> um, I think Rob was next. Yeah, um, thanks for the talk. Um, that's very interesting. So that, that partly clears out the question already. Um, I, I was more aware about this, this concept of heterogeneity um, generally. So, and it, it, it's, it's in part a metaphysical question. So the way you characterized it was um, not only emphasizing the interactions between the components or entities that you find within the community, but you were also saying that they form some complex entity via these interactions. 
that this seems to me to uh, uh, already imply a specific stance on this discussion of how to interpret the metaphysical status of ecological communities, where you have the endpoints, this individualistic view versus this highly causally integrated. So, would you? Is it intentional that um, this, this your, your concept of heterogeneity comes out um, on the far side of the spectrum towards this? Uh, at times, it sounds like a superorganism view. Or would you say, well, this concept is metaphysically neutral with how you how you see the community? So, yeah. I don't think I'm neutral. I don't want to go back to the old Garrison, you know, to, to, to that discussion in, in the history of ecology. But even when you go to Weaver and you think about messy and, and you think about complex systems, uh, you do not have to think about a collective in this mythical... Uh, the metaphysics of a collective don't have to be, don't have to sound strange. All I want to say is that, but, but I'm not neutral. So I'm saying, uh, at least if we go here. Oh, wait. Um, so in, in this 3C model, oh yeah, ah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, now you'll see it there, right? Okay. So, um, you're correct that the object that I'm talking about is a collect is some kind of a collector, it's some kind of group. Okay? So I'm starting from a group. But the group need not be some kind of mysterious superorganism. It can be just a collection of things. But the, the property of heterogeneity, like the property of diversity, a single entity cannot be diverse, right? It just cannot be. So I'm I'm, I'm not neutral in the sense that I'm starting the discussion assuming that the individual is within a group context. Okay? But, but that group context need not be some kind of superorganism, especially when you look at the history of the concept of superorganism and you see how it has been used <coughs> in the 60s okay? as some kind of fascist uh, or in the 40s. And uh, so, so before World War II, you have people from both ends, political ends, using the concept of superorganism for their own terms. So you'd have someone like Uxken joining the Nazi party, talking about a superorganism. But, but you would have also Wheeler talking about superorganism in a, in, a, in a different way. Or Ali took it. So you would have different political views talking about superorganism. But after World War II, whenever you say superorganism, People think about it as some kind of oppressive, frightening entity. Think about how Hamilton is talking about a superorganism. It's terrifying. Okay, so I'm not meaning superorganism in that in that way. I think the reason why people after World War II started talking about superorganism in that way is because of the connotation. Uh, of a superorganism, okay? So I'm assuming a group, and yes, I'm not neutral, but that group is not some kind of oppressive, uh, frightening collective that determines everything for the individual. Even a collection is a group, okay? Um, yeah, uh, thank you for the talk. So, so I really appreciate your your advice to try, because we know in history of science, even in physical science, often often we miss some phenomena because we did not measure interaction between and part of the system. But when you say try, it's also a little bit misleading because 
it's extremely difficult to build that kind of measure. So if we don't have an idea of what we have to measure, we will never finish the measure <laughs> internal stuff. So it, it must be guided by some <coughs> model about what is a relevant interaction. Yeah. And here I can see maybe difference between you know biological system, social system. So for, for biodiversity, for conservation in the biology system, where should we, what kind of model should we use to guide us to build, okay, that, that, that could be a relevant measure. That, that, no, maybe not, maybe we should do it later when we have more money. No, wow, that's so good. The fault, typically, you know, when someone tells you you have a good question, so the guy's that he has an answer, but I don't. <laughs> And uh, not yet. I definitely want to. It's a bit like, uh, you know, Wittgenstein, the paradox of rules. I have to build a model for how to use the model and then a, a model for... Um, we're trying exactly now to do that. Uh, but you're right. Right now I'm waving my hands. So I have some kind of tool and I'm trying to, first of all, to use it good enough and second after doing that to find some uh, easy guidelines about where for now I just said if it's common uh, if it doesn't really matter interactions it will survive anyway Th think about think about an invasive species it survives whatever locality it, it arrives to right so I do not recommend uh, checking heterogeneity for that. So not for an invasive species, but, but I don't have a good answer. And, and, and it's definitely missing, and we want to do that. that that's, th this is a book project that will take up a few years. But that, can I? Yeah, sure. But that will be maybe theory driven. So we, we will have to have maybe better theories about ecology and to, to, to to help us to guess what would be the relevant factor to measure in certain contexts. And I, I'm not in philosophy of biology, so I don't know how, how far are these theories to guide us about how oh, this factor is more relevant than this one, or probably not. That I don't know. Because as far as I know, I'll, my colleagues in biology are not a lot driven by theoretical models. They, they are quite, they dislike them. They, because most of the time they are so wrong that maybe we should not use them. I totally but I see here to build a complex measure. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot. Oh, it's work. quite ah this one or the no, mathematics the, of the, it's but the mathematics when you have to weigh the nodes and the the relations. Yeah, yeah that's so tough. first you have to identify the right nodes. After that, you have to weight them or certain way independent or dependent of the relations, and you have to identify the right relations. Yeah, so yeah. the general problem is very difficult. Maybe in certain cases, you know, because we know already a lot of stuff about the interaction, it could be manageable. But for an ecological system... I, I, I totally agree, and, and what we aim for is in these particular contexts that we really care about, and we have... Why do we care about it? We already have quite a bit of knowledge about it. And for example, we are afraid that this species is on the brinks of extinction and we really care about it. I totally agree with you. The only thing I, I, I think differently is we don't want to start from the theory. So we do want to start with a few cases. In the social world, we have a case that we want to build and in the ecological world. We want to build this thing only upon how it's being used. Okay. And, and, and honestly, I think a lot of theory it doesn't, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I, I, theory is great, but if it just remains that way, and if we as philosophers only look at ourselves and how we use our theories and our concepts, it's, um, then, then we come close to, I think Penrose said it about uh, that philosophers are relevant to scientists like uh, ornithologists are relevant to birds. I don't think we will be relevant if we don't actually work with scientists and we don't actually see, um, try to find something to say that fit, that is 
that is in some kind of dialogue with how scientific work is being done. Yes. So I know I'm a third year, so I'm a developmental biologist with interest in ecology, so just to state the point. But following up on Alexander's question, how do you then define an ecosystem as a single heterogeneity, as mm -hmm. a collection of heterogeneities? Because that's what people and conservationists are all about. So the, the cases that we looked at actually uh, people began from the locality. They knew what, what location they want to conserve. Yeah, which you cannot measure. And then it's, it's, often, it's often these land use uh, borders, <coughs> right? So you have a nature. Society told you that here you have a nature reserve. And now you want to conserve that nature reserve. So you actually, it doesn't emerge from nature. It emerged from social agreements. And from there we started. And it actually, thank you for this question, I didn't notice it before, but it actually in all the cases that I followed, it began from there. And people were careful to choose a spot that was socially uh, uh, limited by society and not by nature because probably nature is so complex. Uh, questions? Uh, well, I wanted to get a bit more concrete on the case studies uh, because I, I was curious about um, uh, on, on the, the Town Square Academia um, case study you talked about. Um, about this, this maps, right, that you're sort of rewriting ah. a bit, these maps. Ah, that's really cool. Um, because it, 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 um, it seemed that you were taking what you call this, this local interactionist notion of space and you, you sort of rewriting the, the official map, right, so that's the exogenous space. And, and so there seems to be some translation work. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Because at some point you, you, you claim that, that, that that translation work is actually not possible, that, that either you have one or you have the other. But here you, you, you seem to, to explain a case where you successfully did it. So I don't know who did that, how did they do it? Um, okay, yeah. So I think uh, where it's incommensurable is in the field, at the lowest spatial scale where you actually put your device, okay? This is not what happens here. Even in the field, when uh, they, they, and it happened wherever I checked, right? The device was either here or here. But later on, when you, for example, check, um, <clears throat> you built your, you, you, you need to put on your, your model map, right? You want to predict in occupancy modeling, right? You want to predict where, uh, what are the chances that I will find this species in this locality, given what I've found now? Okay? And given the detectability effort that I've invested in this locality in finding this species, now I'm taking this map <coughs> and I'm projecting. So, <clears throat> just like here, it's, uh, it's not in the field, it's in the map. And here what you have is you had a trap line of 40 traps. Now you can agree on the number of species or the number of individuals, organism, found on the, on the whole trap, okay? So even if in each particular, so the incommensurability is at the lower spatial scale. On the higher spatial scale, where maps happen, mm -hmm. at least ecological maps, then it's not incommensurability. Now you have indeterminacy because there is not a fact of in, indeterminacy, let's say, of, uh, you have two kinds of indeterminacy. Indeterminacy of reference and indeterminacy of uh, translation. So first of all, let's take indeterminacy of translation, okay? So we can agree on the number of organisms found on this 40. <coughs> 40 traps, okay? And um, 
And then I can say, uh, and we can agree on the polygon. What you see here is a map from 1880 with uh, 2019 polygons mashed on it. Okay? Uh, so what you have here is an assemblage of data. And we can agree on that. Why we can agree on that? It's not pinpointed on some particular point. Okay? And so you can take the average, this is a polygon, for example, of rainfall. You can take the average rainfall and draw this polygon. And you can take the average number of uh, organisms trapped and put them here or elsewhere. Okay? But, it's on, but that's a different scale than what I've talked about. And at different scales, uh, you uh, prioritize different things. So what you have here, yes, you have to have um, generality over realism. Okay? Uh, and so we can agree, okay? We can agree that um, the data of the world is that uh, 50 organisms were found on average and uh, on average there's 200 millimeters of rain here okay in this area and 250 let's say or 220 or let's say over here we can agree on that now on the same data that we agree on well, that's why it's indeterminacy of uh, translation we can have different theory sentences that will describe this, okay? So I can describe it in different ways on the map. We all know that, right? I can have different statistical packages to use on the data that I already agreed upon, okay? And there is no fact of the matter here. It's not new data that emerged, okay? And that's how it mashes together. You see, because it's a different scale. And, and the problem here is not incommensurability. It's, it's, it's also a problem because different, different theory sentences okay, can fit the same thing, but, but the, the theory sentences don't agree with each other. Okay? Or, or to, take it, to take it to indeterminacy of reference, you can have, you can have a model based prediction. <coughs> Okay, and what, what are the chances of finding here, I don't know, ground squirrels? Well, there's no ground squirrels here, I don't know, hyenas, okay? And, and, and we can agree, okay, on the prediction, this theory sentence, prediction of the model, okay? But when you come to the world, to, to the data that's supposed to describe the causal explanation, you can have very, very different, you can agree on the prediction, but you can have very, very different descriptions of the world that will lead to that. And it's difficult to decide. So these are different types of problems. And we often, sometimes, not, not we, sorry, and maybe not you, but very often philosophers of science use these terms as if it's the same as if incommensurability is very similar to indeterminacy, and indeterminacy of reference is similar to indeterminacy of, tra of meaning, translation, okay? And as if indeterminacy of translation, there is no translation, okay? <coughs> and scientists help philosophers, because looking at the work helps you see these conceptual differences much more clear. I want to, can I piggyback on that? Sure. Um, because one thing, so this, yeah, I, I'm reminded of something, so uh, I know you know this. Uh, Angela Patochnik has argued a bunch that uh, for spatial scale as this kind of super important organizing concept, especially in theoretical ecology. Um, but one thing that she's always said that I thought was really interesting, and I'm just, I'm just interested to know whether you've seen this in your work, one of the reasons that she's argued for that is that a bunch, in a bunch of her examples, 
people have actually been really self-conscious and really explicit about what spatial scales they're operating at, about what spatial scales they expect their claims to hold for, et cetera, et cetera. I'm almost hearing in some of the ways that you've been talking about spatial scale that in some of your examples it's much less explicit than that. The, the role that spatial scale is playing is a little more implicit. You have to kind of go find it in the practice. It's a bit more hidden. Um, what do you think? Because that's always, it's always surprised me a little bit when I, when I read her that, 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 uh, that in a lot of her examples it's very, you know, it's, it's very, it's clearly stated by the scientists in the practice. I guess, you know, we have this theory about species dispersal, but we only think that it works at this kind of meso scale. Um, what do you see in the examples that you've been? So, um, in the lowest spatial scale, people don't, they don't publicize about it. So, so they, that's the field work. Mm -hmm. You don't see it in the paper. If you don't follow people in the field, you won't know <coughs> about it, okay? Um, but that's it. Once on higher spatial scales, okay? So after, I think as colleges are, are, are very, um, given, you know, Simon Levine's work about scale, people are very attentive, very careful, you know, very smart people are working in this field. And, and so they're not, um, they're aware of the scale that they're talking about. Also because scale matters to effort. And when you, talk, when you build an occupancy model, you have to talk about the effort that went into it. And, and so scale comes there. Not always, but often. So what I'm saying is that I think, I, I agree with what you're saying, and I think um, it's a resolution issue. Uh, so meso, and local and global is huge scale. So for me, because I'm very provincial, so I care about particular places, and I care about particular types of injustice. And so Meso and Israel is extremely small. <laughs> so it's, it's the size of the whole country, the size of New Jersey, okay? So what you think as Meso is, is five times our scale. So it's a resolution thing, but, but I, I agree. Yeah, nice, nice, nice. Anything else? Yeah, yeah I, I had a question about one of your main conclusions, namely that um, heterogeneity doesn't follow from diversity. So you gave one example in which that's not the case, but unlike a more general case, isn't it reasonable to think that typically if we have more stuff, then there will be more relations, more interactions. And so, starting for general overall policies to increase diversity, that typically will, will do well with heterogeneity as well. So maybe I should say it in a more general term. I'm saying this. Whenever the phenomena you're tracking is the phenomena pre-requires a collective entity, a complex collective entity, okay, and that resembles a community. So whenever the, the phenomenon you're, you're tracking uh, involves that type of entity, um, if there's a, above a certain level of diversity, if diversity increases, it mm, makes sense that heterogeneity would decrease, okay? Whereas if the entity you're tracking is a collection of things, and the more diverse it is, um, the, the small interactions that occur in any way would continue. So you won't, I don't expect the conflict to emerge there. I expect the conflict only in the cases um, that interactions really matter for the function of the entity that I'm tracking. And only if the entity that I'm tracking is a kind of um, community or a complex collective. Okay? This is just 
just a question for clarification. It may sound like criticism, but it's definitely not. So, and I probably missed it myself by not being you know, mentioned, but what I'm missing in this is, is, is difference. Uh, like, heterogeneity, after all, it's about difference. Diversity is about difference. Measuring difference. And interactions in itself has nothing difference related. Uh, if that's what you're focusing on, I mean, like if we talk about superorganisms and so on, uh, fascist sort of uh, 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 regimes or, or groups or uh, Stalinist, like if everything is the same but interacts very, like uh, um, uh, very uh, well, seriously, <laughs> uh, 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 intensely, that's perfectly possible. Uh, uh, homogeneous groups act interact more easily even. Um, so, so, so I was expecting something like interaction in virtue of difference or something like that, uh, mm. rather than interaction as like the main thing. Like first find the difference and then see what does it do for the interactions, uh, rather than go directly to the to the interactions and like leave the difference question open. Or maybe it's not left open. Um, okay, so, so maybe I wasn't clear enough, but no, I'm, I'm beginning from assuming difference. Right. So, so think about the, the, my watch again. If all the wheels are the same size, it, it won't function again. So I'm, a, I'm not, I'm not might, explaining I mean, what difference is. I'm not explaining what difference is. I'm, I'm saying, assuming that we have difference, okay? in the entity that we're tracking and what types of measuring difference do we have but i'm starting from difference but you're right that i didn't explain what difference is okay and after uh, reading deleuze's uh, book you know it's, it's, uh, there are some points i'm saying I don't know what to say about what difference is. It's, it's, we have a saying in Hebrew, the gadolala, it's too big for me. I'm, I'm concentrating on how people measure difference. But yes, it's, it has to be assumed, the difference. And it's not explicit here. So mm, you're right. Um, well, there's no questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, speaker. Thank you.